sorry, get you in the screen there, Fred. Uh, let's go ahead and begin by reviewing what we saw last week uh, briefly. Let me do it by way of asking questions and see if you can remember what we looked at. I think uh, a number of you don't bring your handouts from last week, so you don't have a <laughs> book to look at. So to, even if you do, try to do it from memory. Uh, first of all, the question was uh, whether or not it was possible to know that we have eternal life. And the first thing we looked at was whether or not it was possible to be wrong regarding our condition. Is it possible to be deceived? And the question would be why. Why is it possible to be deceived? And why is it that there are people who believe they're Christians when they're not really Christians? Why does that happen? I suppose it could be summarized in one word. Just think of some, some of the... What was that? Yes. <laughs> sin. Yes. Sin, uh, sin does not... Tell us the truth, does it? Sin deceives us. Sin deceives uh, us, especially in areas that are most important to us. The things that have to do with, with the Lord. But uh, why would, a, let's say, an unbeliever's life be um, even in any kind of condition where they could even think that regarding themselves? There's something that God does that people can confuse with conversion. Remember what that was? Common grace. Common grace, that's right. God can restrain our sins. He can even give to us some concern for our souls and make us do things that are religious and we can even convince ourselves that we are religious. And then there's that um, that highest level, we might say, of, of uh, common grace, which we would call by the miracle that that's called. And awakening, that's right. Uh, when the Lord works by his Holy Spirit on our consciences to the point where we can't do anything wrong without being so severely convicted and just brings our life into conformity with his word. And we might think because of that, we're saved. But we do realize that even if a person believes that to be true, if it isn't true, it's not going to help them. Okay, is it possible to know that we are saved and truly be saved? I mean, is it possible to have a sound assurance? Okay, we know that that's true. Now, what has to be true of us if we are to know that we're saved? What was the thing we saw that has to be true? If we are to know that we're saved, what's the first thing? We have to be saved. That kind of goes without saying. Sometimes we miss that. Uh, I think we have to be saved before we can know that we're saved. Now, in order to uh, know that we are saved, what are some of the things that uh, you know that have to be true of us? What's what's the most important thing that we've seen over and over and over again? in the evening series as well as we have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ of course but why will we do that what do we have to have okay faith. faith right faith. I had to work through whose whose voice that was and then find the find the face yes <laughs> now we have to have of course more than than uh, any kind of faith we have to have a saving faith and what is it that saving faith works through or works by what is that word what's that love, love that's right it has to be a faith that produces a love for the Lord Jesus Christ for God the Father that's the reason why of course we uh, why we embrace them uh, and of course the Holy Spirit that's the kind of faith he produces the kind of fruit he produces which is love for the Lord and if we have this love, it will also produce all the other fruits of a godly life. Now, let's see. The next question the confession addressed is, how strong can our assurance be? I mean, what is, what potentially, how, how, how firm can we, how firm a conviction can we have? How can you all be surprised who's drinking? Okay. Well, what do we call that with regard to assurance? What's, what's the, um, what's the strongest assurance we can have? Uh, well, no, well, not right now. We're talking about, we, we do know the saint will persevere, but the question is with regard to our subjective comfort level as to how assured we are that we're Christians. Okay, Jan? Infallible. Okay, infallible assurance, which, which means what? It means that there's no, it's definite, it's assured, it's firm. Okay, and we have no doubt, right, that, that we are Christians. That's the kind of assurance the Bible says that we can have. Now we did look at um, th that infallible assurance is only possible, I mean true infallible assurance is really only possible in, in what biblical, I don't want to call it worldview, but I suppose we call it biblical worldview, or what biblical view, Calvinism or Arminianism? <laughs> can, can an Arminian have 
an infallible assurance. Okay, and why not? Because it depends on their ability to continue loving God. That's right. And even if, let's say, a person who believes, and again, we're, we're, we're not using Arminianism as a term of derision, but we're simply using it to summarize the view that my salvation depends at least in part on my work and not entirely on God's. He's seeking election instead of being elected in the faith of Jesus. Right? Uh, very good uh, the Armenians is seeking election by faith, right? Uh, yeah. I, I'm not. Uh, I actually. It's I, I'm, wrong because he's making his own election by believing that he receives election through faith instead of the Calvinistic doctrine of you are being elected first and then faith may be given to you as a gift. Okay. Actually, um, I, I don't know that he thinks he's gaining his own election, but he does believe that because he's done that that God has chosen him. However, he doesn't know that he'll continue to do that, which means that he really doesn't know that God has chosen him because the only, only those that God has chosen are those who will persevere to the end, and until he perseveres to the end, he can't even know that. So, uh, but the idea is that as long as it rests on my works, I might be assured now that I'm walking with the Lord, but as soon as I stop doing that, my assurance ends, and I can't be certain that I'm going to persevere. Because I can't be certain of that, I can't be certain that I'm going to make it to the end, that I'm actually going to be saved, that I'm going to end up in heaven. So those that rely at all on their works will not be able to have really an assurance that makes a difference, that I'm actually going to be saved. I'm still in danger of hell all the time because I might fall out of salvation. So it's only possible in a Calvinistic worldview, a uh, biblical view. Okay. And I think we also looked at last week the fact that, that many believe we shouldn't even want assurance, because if we believe we're saved, we might end up in that view that, well, let me ask you this question. What, what, is, the, um, what is the problem that some Arminians see, uh, Roman Catholics see, with the idea of having an infallible assurance? What do they think it might produce or it will produce? Greg? License to sin. License to sin, that's right. And if we use the grace of God as a license to sin, what does that show about us? <laughs> we're, we're not saved, okay? If we use God's grace, if we use the, the fact that we believe that our, our heaven is certain as an excuse simply to live a licentious life or a sinful life, then obviously the Spirit of God is not working within us. That love for God, which we need in order to be saved. Okay. Now, uh, there was something else, though. There, there, there's, um, let's see. Uh, is this where we dealt with it? Okay. Okay. Now, there were three things that assurance, that assurance is based on, or three ways in which we can obtain infallible assurance. <laughs> uh, what is it that God has to do, first of all, before we can have any kind of assurance? I mean, obviously, He has to save us. We know that. But uh, there were three things that we saw the confession told us that our assurance is based on. Do you remember what those three things are? God, first of all, has to, let me, let me give you the hint, maybe this will get the other two going. He has to give us a promise, right? If we don't have a promise of eternal life, then we really can't have any assurance, can we? Okay. But he promises to give eternal life to whoever will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from their sins. Now, how do we know that, what, that, that we have received that promise? How do we know the promise has to do with us? How do we know that, you know, that um, uh, we're not just deceiving ourselves? What does God do in us? We've already talked about the, the, the premier one, which is love. But what are some of the things that God does within us to show us that that promise actually applies to us? When he changes our heart, he gives us his spirit. Okay. Producing that, that love in our hearts. But we might say primarily, of course, we have to love the Lord Jesus. We have to believe on the Lord Jesus. We have to turn from our sins. But... Basically, it's the evidence of all those different fruits of sanctification. You know, we're, we're going through these things in the evening service, and we're seeing there's quite a number of them. Irresistible grace, is that it? Um, no, not necessarily. That's, that's where the Lord changes our heart to bring us to himself, but that's, that's what starts it all, okay? But every, every evidence of, of uh, this process of sanctification, which again is the expression of, of love, uh, every one of those is an evidence that we are really Christians. Uh, I don't know if you remember in Solomon Stoddard, 
But he said, if you can look at one good work that you do and know that it is motivated by a genuine love for God, then you can know that you're saved. And you can actually build upon that. But you don't want to just build upon that one act. Or, um, I forget, because this is tied into the evening service, I forget now where I was going to bring this up. But, you know, we can think about the things we've done in the past, or we can think about things that are happening now as far as those acts of love. And we want those things uh, to give us assurance that are happening now and not just to think back, you know, several years ago. I remember then, that was a true act of love for God, but I can't know about anything else that's happened since then. Uh, we need to uh, try to discern within ourselves if the reason why we're doing what we're doing is because we truly love Him. And then that's tied into the third one, which is the witness of the Spirit. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And he does that either by giving us the confidence to call God our Father. I mean, anybody can say those words, right? Uh, God is my Father, or uh, Heavenly Father in, in, in these prayers. But the question is, when we do that, do we have the conviction within our hearts that, that that's genuine, that, that that's true, you know, that I really have that relationship? The Spirit of God can give us that confidence. That's one way. And the other is, of course, by all the fruits that He bears in our lives that show us you know, that, that we really do love the Lord. That's another way the Spirit of God bears witness with us. And then something about the, um, the idea of the Spirit being our, our inher our, the, the down payment of our inheritance. Remember that um, uh, He gives us sort of a foretaste of heaven. It, it's subjective. Again, a lot of these are subjective. Some of them are objective as we see the fruits of the Spirit at work in our lives. We say, that's the Spirit bearing witness with, with my spirit that I am a child of God. Or as I call God my Father, that's subjective. That's the confidence I have to do that. Or if I have some sense of the peace and joy that the Spirit of God brings, that's subjective as well. But that's another witness of the Spirit that I am a child of God. So anyway, uh, God's promise, those evidences, and then this internal witness of the Spirit, these are the ways in which, uh, these are the things we build on as far as an infallible assurance. If God didn't promise it, I couldn't have it. If God promises it, I need to know that I have it, and I can only know that by these evidences. And, of course, the witness of the Spirit that it's mine. Any questions on that? We'll, if not, we'll proceed to the next uh, couple of sections. Okay. Does everybody have a handout? <laughs> Do you all need a handout? Oh, we ran out? Of, oh, wow. Okay. Well, that's, that's a good problem. Maybe we could... Uh, What's that? Okay, that's good. All right, we're looking at the two last paragraphs of chapter 18 or section 18 of the Confession. And the first one um, has to do with the level of assurance that comes with faith. Whether or not it's, you know, there's a debate in church history uh, within reform, the Reformed camp, because you really can't have this debate, as we already said, in an Arminian camp because it doesn't exist. There is no such thing as infallible assurance. But it does exist within the, the Calvinistic way of looking at things, and within the Calvinistic circles, there's, there's been a disagreement over whether or not, if I'm truly saved, I will have automatically an infallible assurance. I will know without any doubt, or have such a strong and certain assurance that there's really no question that I'm a Christian. Now, Westminster would, would say, no, that isn't true, and we'll see that in this section. So let me go ahead and read uh, chapter or section, oh, what is it? chapter 18, section 3. This infallible assurance does not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of ordinary means, attain thereunto. And therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance. So far is it from inclining men to looseness. Now that, um, I suppose that was two long sentences. There's quite a bit in there and we need to just spend a little time looking at that. Now first of all, we might ask this question, what kind of assurance will every believer 
have. And uh, the question we're asking here is, will he automatically have infallible assurance, or no assurance, or will he have something in between? One thing we do need to recognize is that uh, even though believers will not necessarily have an infallible assurance, that they'll know for certain they're saved, but they will have, uh, they won't have that, but they will have some assurance. Okay, we, we do want to get away from the idea that the confession is teaching here that if you have saving faith, it's possible to have that and have no assurance. Okay, they, they wanted to, you know, to, to make sure we, we understand that isn't the case. But on the other hand, the first thing they want to remind us of is that infallible assurance will not be necessarily a part of that. Okay? Now, we already saw that if we have saving faith, we'll have assurance based on the promise of God, based on the fruits of the Spirit's work in our lives, either past or present. That's where I was thinking. I put it somewhere in here. And by virtue of the Spirit's witness in our hearts. But infallible assurance is not something that, that we'll automatically have. Which, which is sad in a way because it would be nice if, if we could you know, be saved and know that we're saved and have no doubt. But it's comforting on the other hand because how many of us here have ever struggled with assurance of salvation? The fact that we struggle with it doesn't mean we're not saved. So that can be comforting from, from that respect. Okay, so here's where the debate comes in. Heidelberg Catechism, which uh, is one of what's called the three forms of unity that are used in continental reformed churches such as the CRC, uh, Christian Reformed Church, the United Reformed Church, that's the URC, the Reformed Church in the United States, that's the German Reformed Church. Um, we have one over here at Trinity and uh, one up in, in Lodi. Um, those that come from a continental background, even the RCA, the Reformed Church in America, although I think they're, you know, I'm not sure how, how strongly they hold to that, they, they have three documents for their confession, the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort. And there's, there's really, out of all that material that's in those three forms of unity, when you compare that with the Westminster Confession of Faith, both Reformed you know, traditions, there's really only two main differences between the two of them. And this is one of them, okay? This is one, and the other one is the view of the Sabbath day, whether it's a day that, that is to be kept holy to the Lord or whether it's basically a, a more ordinary day or perhaps not even a designated day, but a day that people agree they're going to meet together and worship on, uh, and whether or not you would keep the whole day holy and how you would do that. There, there's a big difference between the two on, on those two issues. But we're looking at one of them right here. And if I can, let me just simply say, this is something I heard from J.I. Packer, which I thought was very helpful that this is reflecting what Calvin believed. And what Calvin did when he defined uh, assurance, he defined it as saving faith, so that faith and assurance are the same thing, as far as he was concerned. So if you have faith, guess what you're gonna have? <laughs> and he actually defined, uh, we go beyond that, faith and, and what seems to be infallible assurance as the same thing, okay? Well, we see that reflected in Heidelberg Catechism, question 21, where it says, what is true faith? It's on your, your hand out there. The answer is, true faith is not only a certain knowledge whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also an assured confidence which the Holy Ghost works by the gospel in my heart, that not only to others, but to me also, remission of sin, everlasting righteousness and salvation are freely given by God, merely of grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. Now this is a definition of faith, I want you to understand. Uh, does anyone remember how, how, uh, how typically we define faith? Do we usually define faith as not only these things are true, but that what Jesus has done, he has done for me. That's what, what they're saying. How do we define faith? Does anyone remember the three elements of faith? There's actually one of them included here. Right, well, I'm thinking a little bit more of a... Okay. I'm thinking a little bit more now of, of how we define it uh, theologically throughout the scriptures and not just a certain verse, but certainly uh, that would, would be helpful. Uh, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Uh, how else do we define faith? What, what are the things that are necessary for there to be a saving faith? What's the difference between a saving faith and what we call a historical faith? One that simply believes, you know, these things took place. Do you remember what those elements are? Anyone? 
Okay, the first one is knowledge, right? I have to know what I have to believe. The second one is a sense. I have to believe those things are true, which is what this seems to be talking about here. A certain knowledge whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in His Word. This seems to be a sense. But then there's that third element, which doesn't seem to be mentioned here. And that is uh, where I actually receive and rest in Jesus Christ alone and trust in Him. That's what we call, well, yeah, the, the three terms or the notes or the content, the, the ascensus or the ascent to that knowledge, and then the actual trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, which is fiducia, that I'm actually trusting Jesus to save me. Okay? I'm looking to Him and His righteousness alone and away from my works to save me. So I'm putting my trust in him. It's, uh, it was illustrated by uh, D. James Kennedy one time as, as saying, you know, that the difference is kind of like this, where you take an ordinary chair and you ask a person, well, what, what is that? Well, the person says, it's, it's a chair. I know it's a chair. That's the knowledge. I know this is a chair. Uh, do you believe that chair could hold you up? Well, yes, I've seen chairs before. That one looks sturdy. It's made of aluminum. It's got, uh, you know, looks like it's welded together securely. Uh, uh, I believe if I sit in that chair, it's going to hold me up. I have, I have that assent. I assent to the fact that the chair can do that. But then the question is, well, is that chair actually holding you up? Well, it only can if you sit in it. And then you know, you see that it can. And you experience that personally. And he used that as an analogy of what saving faith is in our lives. That we not only know who Jesus is, we not only know he can save and believe that he can, but we actually trust in him to save us. We actually rest in him, sit in him, as it were. Well, you see that Heidelberg Catechism is not defining faith in that way. It's defining it as certainty these things are true and that Jesus has done this for me. So it's, it's basically including this idea of, of assent with assurance and calling that saving faith. Do, do you see the difference there between those, those two things? Okay. But the question is, is saving faith, does it necessarily include this level of assurance, because it you know, talks about uh, what an assured confidence. That's what saving faith includes. I think oftentimes we fall short of that, don't we? And certainly the Westminster Confession is talking about a faith that does not reach that level. It says here that uh, a true believer may wait long, conflict with many difficulties, uh, before he be a partaker of infallible assurance, which seems to be expressing the same thing that Heidelberg is, is expressing in the idea of saving faith. Now here's a couple of, of questions. If, if it is true that this infallible assurance or this, this assured certainty that, that I am saved, that Christ has done what he has done, is mine, then why do we have the, the book of First John in the Bible? So that, that's an interesting question that arises. Why would John have to write to them? As the, the theme verse of the book says, 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. And he doesn't just simply say, well, if you have saving faith, then you'll know that you have eternal life. But he, he goes through a series of, of many tests by which we might know that. The thing that, that we've already seen, the confession points to, is those evidences of God's grace within our lives so that we can know the promise of eternal life actually applies to us. Okay? If assurance automatically came with salvation, with, with true saving faith, you wouldn't have to write these kinds of things to them because they would already know and be assured that that's the case. And then why would we have these challenges in Scripture to make sure that we are elect? Second Peter 1.10, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Uh, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. And these things, there is a huge, well, a large number of things that are the fruits of the Spirit's work within us, as far as moral excellence and so forth, uh, different ways in which the Spirit of God is working in us, be diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing you. Why would you have to do that if saving faith brought assurance? And then, of course, the challenge that Paul gives in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith, examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. So I think the indication in Scripture is that even if you're a true believer, you may still struggle with assurance. Okay? You may still struggle with the idea of whether or not you are truly a Christian. Now, oftentimes today, in many churches, we don't have that kind of struggle. I told you that there, there's not only the, uh, you know, the Calvinistic worldview that uh, basically says God is the one who saves, and if you know that he has, you can know you're going to make it to the end. 
And there's the Arminian view that basically says you're saved as long as you're obedient and faithful and believing and you don't fall into too much sin and as long as you don't die having committed some terrible sin without repenting. Okay, again, there's not a whole lot of assurance in that kind of a worldview. But there's also an overlapping view that says that, um, you know, I, God didn't necessarily choose me, but I made the choice and then God chose me based on that choice. And once I went forward and, and prayed that prayer, that uh, if I was sincere, and of course uh, the way they test that is, um, is somewhat uh, questionable, um, how can you know whether a person sincerely believes on the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, he's going to practice righteousness, his life's going to bear good fruits, but what they will say is, if they turn away and they spend the rest of their lives fighting against God, trying to tear his church down and promoting atheism, they're still on their way to heaven. Okay. Now that's the idea that, that I will, if, if I'm saved, I'll never be lost. They're, they're at least convinced that, that that particular point is true, although they're not convinced that a true believer will live a life of godliness, that a true believer, they believe, can live a life of, of ungodliness. Now there are a lot of people today who listen to that, to that view, and because they made, took, you know, made that prayer, went forward to the altar call or whatever, uh, seemingly trusted in Jesus, but haven't lived for him ever since, they still have an assurance that they're saved. And if they're on their way to heaven, they're, they're, they're going to make it there ultimately, and yet they're lost. Okay? So again, the importance not only of knowing that we can have assurance, but really what, what we need to be looking for, because this, this doctrine of the perseverance of, of the Christian is, is again of the perseverance of the saint, and not of the perseverance of, of the sinner. So. Uh, Westminster Confession says that, it, that it, it may require many difficulties, it may, uh, you may have to wait a long time, but you can attain it. You should be diligent to make your calling and election sure, uh, even though there are people today who believe they have it and, and all they did to get it was come forward at an altar call and pray to prayer. That doesn't guarantee anything. Okay? All, it, all it means is you came forward and you, you said certain words. Unless God was working savingly in your heart, you're still not a Christian. And if he has, then you're not going to turn away from him and go into the world. You may fall into sin for a time. We already saw that that's possible. But you're not going to fall fully and finally away from him and become his enemy and fight against him for the rest of your life. Because when God saves someone, he transforms them from being a rebel into being an obedient servant. Now, the next question is, if since, well, since infallible assurance is possible, how can we get it? How can we attain it? Now the first thing the confession said here is we do not need extraordinary revelation. I don't know if you happen to catch that in the paragraph we read. He says, or the confession says, yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of the means, attain thereunto. Now maybe you've looked at your handouts already, but do you have any idea what, what they have in mind there? when they're saying without extraordinary revelation. Why would they even have to put that in there? Who did they have in mind? Remember, confessions are formed out of controversies that take place in the history of the church. And this one is one that did take place in the history of the church. As a matter of fact, I have a quote here from Trent. Does that give you some idea as to where this view may have come from? Basically, we looked at last week the fact that Roman Catholics believe that it's bad to have infallible assurance because they believe it leads to presumption. We're going to see that Westminster believes it's just the opposite, actually. But Trent wrote this regarding justification, and it's, um, we'll read it and then just take a brief look at it. Uh, they write in, under the, in the section under justification, chapter 12 or section 12, no one, moreover, so long as he is in this mortal life, ought so far to presume as regards the secret mystery of divine predestination as to determine for certain that he is assuredly in the number of the predestinate, as if it were true that he, is, that, he that is justified either cannot sin anymore, or if he do sin, that he ought to promise himself an assured repentance for except by special revelation, it cannot be known whom God hath chosen unto himself. Some of this looks like it's a little bit confusing. Uh, we have to remember that uh, now, it, this is talking about justification. If, if, you, if you know that you're justified, then you know you're elect and you know you're going to go to heaven. And in the um, Roman Catholic view, if a person is uh, justified, that doesn't mean that 
he has an imputed righteousness from Jesus Christ, it means that he has actually personally become perfect. He has actually become holy. And that's where I think this language comes from, where it says either he cannot sin anymore. I mean, if you're perfect, you reach perfection, you know, uh, you're not going to sin anymore. Or perhaps that possibility exists because if he do sin or if he does sin, that he ought to promise himself an assured repentance. You know, if he does fall into sin, he will repent out of it. He's, Trent is saying that you can't know this except by special revelation. As a matter of fact, when we say, the Bible says we can have assurance, and we point to somebody like Paul, who, who apparently had assurance, they would say, well, God revealed to him by special revelation that he had assurance. So they don't want to disregard the fact that there are people in Scripture who had assurance, but they would want to say that that came from a... Uh, a direct revelation from God, and it's something that we cannot know. It's something we should not know. We shouldn't presume it. And again, the reason being that it may lead to greater and greater sin. However, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we can know that we are saved and that the Lord actually wants us to know. As a matter of fact, we just saw the commandments to, to do that, didn't we? To make our calling and election sure. Well, the Spirit, first of all, the confession says that uh, all we really need is the Spirit's work through the ordinary means of grace in order to know that this is true. We've already seen one of the elements is the witness of the Spirit, right? Now, in 1 Corinthians 2.12, Paul writes, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. What's one of the reasons why God gave us His Holy Spirit? is so that we might know the things that God has freely given to us. Uh, does that include salvation? Yeah, I, I would think so. I would hope so. I mean, that seems like the most important one. 1 John 4.13, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. Now, it just occurs to me, too, that remember that Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, is Arminian. And so I think we have to include in their definition here this, this final perseverance. When they're talking about justification, they are talking about somebody who is, is going to be in heaven. But unless you attain that, uh, either by uh, becoming perfect in this life and going directly to heaven when you die, or by dying with some measure of grace in you and then going to purgatory until you finally can attain that, you know, do that uh, satisfaction for your sins, to the point where you finally do become perfect and can enter into heaven. Uh, the idea with them is that um, you know, it's, it's possible, well, there's there a certain number of things we have to do and it's possible uh, to lose that salvation. So it's possible then to know, maybe they're thinking it's possible to know that the Spirit abides in us and that we have this, but because the possibility of losing it is still there, they, they don't want to bring in that absolute certainty that that person can't fall again because they think it's going to lead to sin. So we can't try to understand Trent from our perspective. We have to understand it from an Arminian perspective that uh, uh, this assurance is something that, uh, in, in, well, is, is not desirable. So uh, what I'm saying is that, that they may still look at these verses and say, well, yeah, the Spirit does show us these things, but He doesn't show us the fact that we're ultimately going to persevere to the end, that we could still be lost. So they would have to understand it in those terms. Okay, but anyway, the Spirit does show us these things. We know that it's possible. We know that if you're saved, you can't lose your salvation. We've already seen that under perseverance. So we're not going to uh, demonstrate that again, but just simply assume it here. But the idea is, if the Spirit of God reveals this to us, then the more we have of His work in our lives, then the stronger our assurance is going to be. Right? If part of His ministry is to assure us of the things given to us by God, then the more or the stronger his work is within us, the more convinced we're going to be that, that we're the Lord's. So how do we strengthen the Spirit's work in our life? There, there's two main ways. And as we do these things, it strengthens our assurance. So what are those two different, uh, two different ways? One is listed in the uh, confession. The other one, you know, we'll have to think about it for just a bit. How can we strengthen the work of the Spirit in our hearts, Greg? Okay, the means of grace, right? Those are channels by which God gives to us more and more of the Spirit's work. And then what's the other one, which is basically the, the opposite would be, of course, not using the means, but what are some of the things that we can do that will take away the Spirit's work? Sin. Sin. 
Okay? Grieving and quenching the Spirit of God. Sinning by doing things that are wrong or by not doing things that are our duty, that are right. Okay? The, the more we quench the Spirit's work within our souls, the less assurance we're going to have. Is it, any, any, is it surprising that when a Christian falls into sin that he struggles with assurance? It's because the Spirit's work is, is lessened you know, to such a degree that uh, he may not even be able to, to know uh, much at all. Okay? But again, we're going to see that um, God is never going to take away all of it to the point where we just utterly crumble in despair. Even during times we fall into deep sin, the Lord still gives us some level of assurance. And we'll look at that at the end. Okay, we've already looked at this. Since infallible assurance is possible, you know, it's possible without extraordinary revelation through the Spirit's work, what should we do? Well, we already saw the commands. Make your calling and election sure. Again, 2 Peter 1.10 and 2 Corinthians 13.5. And then the confession gives some of the reasons why we should do this so that we might have a stronger comfort. Um, let's see, was this the part where... Um, it seems like this re repeated several times. I want to make sure we don't miss it. But the more we have the Spirit of God, the more we're going to have these things listed here. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The hope of what? Well, the hope, I would imagine, of heaven and the fact that we're going to make it to the end. So the God of hope may he fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may have this hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The more we have of the Spirit's work, the more we have of this assurance, the more we're going to have of hope. And, of course, the peace and the joy that comes from knowing that we have this hope in heaven. You know, that if, if we die, I mean, and we're all going to die... All, we're all going to die someday. I mean, whether we're young or old, or that day is going to come for us, whether later or sooner. But isn't it good to know that if you die, or when you die, that you're going to be with the Lord in heaven? Doesn't that give you some kind of joy and peace in this life? I mean, what is it that should frighten the unbeliever more than anything else? Of course, it, what should frighten him is the fact that if he dies, he's going to be in hell. But he doesn't believe that. At least he doesn't say he believes that. I think the Bible says he knows something of that, enough to know that it's true but of you know, absolute nothingness, perhaps going back into nothingness, or you know, if he does have a sense of that judgment coming ahead, that, that's a terrible way to live. How can you have peace and joy knowing that you're not certain of what's going to happen when you die? But if you know that it's just the beginning of, of the best part of your life, and that's going to stretch on for endless ages, uh, that can give us a great deal of peace and comfort, and that's what the Lord wants us to have. And that should, in turn, strengthen our love and thankfulness to God, as uh, Paul says, I think it's in Ephesians 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. We usually look at Ephesians 1, and we look at it for what it says about election. He's predestined us you know, before the foundation of the world, that we should be conformed to the image of Christ, and so forth. But we forget that this is all included in this this you know, uh, well, what do you want to call it? Not a doxology, but a, 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 an outburst of praise. Right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on to enumerate what those are, but the whole idea is that, that um, he wants to, to praise and bless God for giving these great gifts. And if you know that they belong to you, that's, that's what will be in your heart to do. You'll love him more, you'll be thankful more, and that should generate within us a greater desire, I would imagine, to serve the Lord. Uh, Psalm 119.32, I shall run the way of your commandments, for you will enlarge my heart. I think the more we're encouraged that heaven is ours, uh, the more we're going to want to, of course, obey the Lord, not only from the thankfulness standpoint, but the fact that we have a strong assurance means we have a good measure of the Spirit's work within us, and as He works within us, He'll also give to us the desire to serve. Now, the last question in this section is, will a strong assurance promote presumption as Roman Catholics believe? One thing we can agree with, it will in the lives of those who are unconverted. If a person believes he's saved when he isn't saved, that certainly will happen. Yes, Steve? Only Catholics that uh, thinking of presumption that my Catholic friends that I know 
those guys run around with much presumption. They, they run around doing what? With much presumption. Do they believe that they're saved and they'll, they'll never lose, or they can never lose their salvation? No, most of the Catholics I know, I don't believe they can fall any day. Yeah. So the Roman Catholic position of, of concern about that uh, doesn't seem to be real. Maybe that's because of what they teach. Well, actually, what you've just from what you just said, it seems to prove that it is real because what they're saying is that if you have an infallible assurance that you're going to make it to heaven and you can't fall away, that'll create presumption. But you're talking about Roman Catholics who don't believe that. See, so that the, the idea that they can fall away and that they're just you know they have to maintain that straight course to make it to heaven keeps them in the right path so that they don't fall away. Yeah. So what they're saying is that, it, that if we told our people, you know, that, uh, that if you're genuinely saved, that you're going to make it to heaven, they're afraid that it's going to, you know, loosen those restrictions and they're going to live ungodly lives. They effectively reached their goal, uh, the, the, the teaching. <clears throat> yeah. Because there isn't any presumption. Right, right. That's, they want to make sure there isn't any presumption. Have you ever noticed that uh, works-based religions, that there's more work going on in those? <laughs> <laughs> there is, in, in the more, uh, I can't say this absolutely, I mean, because certainly the greatest uh, evangelists and the greatest workers that the Lord ever had were Calvinistic, I believe, right? But uh, oftentimes in churches that, that begin to lose sight of what, what the Bible actually teaches regarding this, that, that the idea of God's sovereignty and, and perseverance will not lead to uh, presumption or that, that this is true, uh, they, they tend to slump down and, and just, again, I've, I've sort of noted it this way, that they think that, that the Christian faith is like a train that you get on. Uh, I, I got on the train when I trusted in Christ. I sit down in the chair and I just wait it out until I reach into my life and then I enter into heaven. There's nothing I have to do, but actually the, the Christian life is one that is very strenuous, full of activity. We need to be fighting against our sins. We need to be growing in holiness. The Bible says that's what will be true of us if we are true Christians. But uh, it is true that it can be, it can lead to presumption, but I think it does in the hearts of those who are unconverted. And that is um, that is a problem, because if a person, again, who is unconverted thinks he's saved, he is going to use it for a license to sin. He is going to be presumptuous. As Second Timothy 3.13, Paul says, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it will open the floodgates. But if a person is truly converted, it won't. That's what uh, the confession tells us at that, at that end section where it says that it will, of course, strengthen us in uh, peace and joy and love and thankfulness and strength and cheerfulness and the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance. So far is it from inclining men to looseness which is against you know, the idea that it will lead to presumption and sin. In the life of the believer, it won't, because true believers who have the Spirit of God within them want to live holy lives and want to pursue that. That doesn't mean that we won't be tempted to do that. If we're faced with a temptation, we might say, well, I can give in to this, and I can repent of it, and I'm going to go to heaven anyway. Paul does address that in Romans chapter 6. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God has set us free from sin. And if we are still the slaves of sin, that means that we're not converted. But if we have been set free, that means we're going to live, as John says, a life of obedience. He goes on to say, John does in his first letter, that if we're saved, we will be pursuing holiness. Same thing that, that uh, Paul says in Romans uh, 8, verse 13. But John says this, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. That's not talking about ceremonial purification, it's not talking about purification of the flesh, it's talking about purification of the spirit, that we will pursue a holy life. And again that passage in Romans 1 verses 1 through 2, and by the way I should mention, I didn't put it in here, but I think it be an excellent verse to look at that Romans 8.13 passage, which is uh, actually could be quite scary for those who use assurance as, uh, as a basis for their sin. He says, um, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. 
for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Notice again, if, if we use assurance as the grounds of sin, he says here, you're not saved. Okay, now that doesn't mean again that Christians aren't going to fall in sin, aren't going to be tempted by sin and so forth. But the, we're not going to practice sin. We're not going to use it as an excuse for sin. We're going to want to overcome it. Even the idea that I can use this as an excuse for sin. I want to be purified of all those things and become as much like Jesus as I possibly can. Again, confession recognizes that true believers will go through difficult times. As a matter of fact, we might as well look at that because that's what the next section says. But are there any questions up to this point? We understand what, he, what confession is saying here. Okay, Let's look at this last section then. True believers may have the assurance of their salvation diverse ways shaken, diminished, and intermitted as by negligence in preserving of it, by falling into some special sin which wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit, by some sudden or vehement temptation, by God's withdrawing the light of his countenance and suffering even such as fear him to walk in darkness and to have no light, Yet are they never utterly destitute of that seed of God and life of faith, that love of Christ and the brethren, that sincerity of heart and conscience of duty out of which, by the operation of the Spirit, this assurance may in due time be revived, and by the which, in the meantime, they are supported from utter despair. What it's saying here is that even if you do attain to this infallible assurance, it's still possible to lose it. It's still possible to have it um, shaken, uh, lessened, uh, going on and off, intermitted, you know. But he never leaves us without any level of assurance. That's why we, we have to say that Westminster believes, and certainly I believe the Bible bears this out, that everyone who is truly saved will have some level of assurance but they won't necessarily have infallible assurance. And even if you do attain to infallible assurance, you might still lose that, but you won't lose your salvation. Okay, so assurance is not static. Okay, it goes up and down. Uh, David was a God after man's own heart. He was the youth that went out and faced Goliath. You know, God is with me. Who can stand against me? You know, this kind of thing. And yet we find David writing Psalm 51. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. By the way, you can see this was penned, the idea of blood guiltiness, after David had murdered Uriah. Okay? And that was after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So he fell into heavy sin. Now we recognize he was struggling. Don't take away your Holy Spirit from me. My bones are broken. Heal them, you know. This kind of thing, but we also see that David still recognized he had a relationship with God, which is why he was crying out to him. So, did he have the same level of assurance as when he faced Goliath? You know, I don't think so. And the same thing can happen to us, and of course it can happen as we, this is one of the ways it can happen, by falling into sin. And Peter's example, when he denied the Lord. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know the man. And immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Christians can have their assurance intermitted. Now, what are the causes? Well, neglecting the means of grace. You know, if you don't use the means of grace, the influence of the Spirit will grow weaker, and your assurance will grow weaker. By falling into a special sin that wounds the conscience and grieves the spirit. It could be a besetting sin or it could mean uh, something similar to what follows next. A sudden or strong temptation. Whenever you fall into sin, it quenches and grieves the spirit. You lose a measure of your uh, assurance. Do not grieve the, the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And again, the temptation in Peter's case was to... Um, either identify with Christ or to deny Him. Was that fear of death? Fear of death. Well, yeah. It, it always has something to do with our comfort level as far as, you know, what, what we're going to have to give up if we, if we fall into this or some pleasure. In this case, it was fear of death. In another case, it might be I'm tempted to some pleasure. 
But either of those two things, if we compromise, are going to cause our assurance to go down. And then one we don't often think about, God may withdraw his presence, his comfortable presence, his, you know, the sense that he's with me, the sense that he's you know, close to me, and allow his children to go for a while without, without strong assurance, to say the least, but without uh, perhaps much assurance at all, however, not entirely without it. Psalm 63, 17, why, O Lord, do you cause us to stray from your ways and harden our heart from fearing you? Return for the sake of your servants, the tribes of your heritage. John Owen has a wonderful uh, sermon on that particular passage where he talks about the fact that God can withdraw uh, from us. And um, even though we may not, oh, maybe it was because of some sin or maybe it wasn't. My spirit always strive with me. Yes. Well, that, actually, I think that's uh, Genesis 6, isn't it? Uh, where it's talking about uh, people who are just in sin. Uh, I think in this case, um, the, Lord, the Lord is training us as, a, as a parents train their children. And, uh, you know, we, we discipline our children. Disciplining doesn't mean just, you know, correcting bad behavior, but it means enforcing good behavior. And in order to do that, um, sometimes parents, well, I'd say all the time, parents uh, tell their children to do things they'd rather not do. And that's part of the discipline of life, isn't it? You go into the military and uh, they, they tell you to do a number of things you don't necessarily want to do. You know, 100 push-ups or run so many miles or uh, do these different things to discipline you, right? And it may not necessarily be punitive. It may just be something that, that trains you. Well, the Lord sometimes can simply withdraw his presence to to bring certain things into our lives that we wouldn't have otherwise. If everything is always fair weather, you're not going to be very strong, right? It's adversity that often brings uh, the, the kind of pressure that's necessary uh, to make us grow. And sometimes when those things happen, the Lord, He brings it, even though it may not be for any particular sin we've fallen into, but He brings it into our lives in order to um, get us to seek Him more because as things are going quite well for us, we maybe aren't seeking Him as much as we should, which is a sin. Maybe he's correcting that, or maybe we are seeking him, but he wants us to seek him more earnestly. Yeah, when, when trouble comes and God seems to be distant, the, the reaction of the true believer is he gets on his, his hands and knees and he seeks the Lord, now, either spiritually or physically. You know, We don't necessarily have to pray from our knees, but sometimes I think it's, it's certainly the right way to do it. But we seek the Lord earnestly, and we wouldn't have done that if we had sensed that everything was going well and everything actually was going well. So sometimes the Lord does that to get us moving again, or perhaps to, to become more earnest in these things. Okay, so there are different things that can affect our assurance, uh, whatever level we might have. We should be trying to attain to infallible assurance. We may not actually attain there, but we can, I mean, there are levels of, of assurance that are strong that are good to have too, even if it happens not to be infallible. But we can also have that diminished through these various ways However, the Lord will never leave us without any assurance. The idea here is that he will always maintain within the hearts of his people some level of faith, some level of repentance. 1 John 3, 9, No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Remember what that means. Practice of sin means giving yourself over to it. And even if you've fallen into, a Christian falls into a sin, and he maybe continues to commit that sin for a while, he never is given fully over to that sin. There's always some level of struggle against it, trying to get out of it, trying to overcome it, trying to be free from it, something which isn't true of the unbeliever who just gives himself to it lustily, unless, again, there's some external pressure that makes him embarrassed about it, getting caught or whatever it may be. Uh, he'll just keep on doing it. He won't stop because it's wrong. He won't have that kind of conviction in his heart, but the believer will. So no one who is born of God will ever fall into a practice of sin where he gives himself entirely over to it, which means there will always be some level of fighting against it, some level of faith, some level of repentance. It will not be all gone. And uh, that means that there will be some measure, albeit, albeit very small, of assurance. And it won't be the kind necessarily that you'll be comfortable with, but it will keep you from collapsing completely under the trial. And then... Um, what Jesus said to, to Peter before he actually fell into that particular temptation that made him sin terribly against the Lord by denying him, Jesus says, but I have prayed for you 
that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. This gives us the reason why our faith and repentance isn't going to fail. It's because Jesus prays for us. Remember, we saw his intercession and how important that is to our assurance and perseverance. We, we, we gain assurance by the fact we know he's praying for us. But he says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And Jesus prays for us as well that our faith would not completely fail us. And then notice he says, when you've turned again. Because the idea is that as Jesus continues to pray for us, he is going to turn us from those sins. So there's going to be some level of faith, some level of repentance that will keep us from utter despair. And we see some reflection of that um, in these next couple of verses. Micah 7, 7 through 9. But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. God, my God will hear me. Do not rejoice over me, O my enemy. Though I fall, I will rise. Though I dwell in darkness, the Lord is a light for me. I will bear the indignation of the Lord because I have sinned against him. Until he pleads my case and executes justice for me, he will bring me out to the light and I will see his righteousness. The idea here being is that uh, God upholds these things in us so that it will give, us, uh, will give us the assurance that we're not going to fall utterly away from him, but that we will eventually be brought out to the point where we can rejoice again, even as the confidence of this particular believer in, in Micah 7, 7 through 9. And then, let's see, Isaiah 57, 15, For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. The Lord often, as it were, pulls the rug out from under us to, to humble us, and yet he does that so that he might bring us back out again, that he might revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. Uh, some of this, as I've said, the, the loss of assurance is so that um, we will be humbled so that we'll repent and desire to be restored again uh, as the Lord brings us very low in order that once we reach that point, the Lord can bring us up again. You realize, of course, that if we are contrite in heart all the time, and walk humbly and lowly before him, uh, the need to be humbled in this way will be much less than if you're climbing the stairs of pride. Uh, you're going to find that the Lord's going to topple that over and you're going to go and plunge down into not utter despair, but you'll, you'll reach a, a point where you'll be very low before the Lord will bring you out of it. So we must always beware of pride. Uh, if we humble ourselves, we won't need to, but if we don't, the Lord will humble us so that he might exalt us again. So the point is, that even though these things will humble us and bring us perhaps to the brink of despair, we won't despair. And the things that the Lord gives to us and sustains in us are meant actually to, to turn that all around and to bring us back out again. So uh, the Lord does not intend to lose us. It's like the, again, this idea of, of uh, the Christian life being a straight and narrow path. On either side, you have a slope that falls into more and more sin, let's say. And if you go off the path to the right or to the left, you're getting in dangerous territory. It's a slippery slope. For the Christian, the Lord puts something there to catch him. He'll only let him go so far and no further. For the unbeliever, they just fall off the edge and go into the pit. So the Lord will only let us go so far. And then his ultimate goal is to bring us back onto the path. And as long as we're on the path, again, Pilgrim's Progress, you ever notice that as long as Pilgrim was on the path, it might have been hard, but at least he knew where he was going. And he was happy to walk that way. But it's only when he got off the path that he ran into trouble. And he lost his assurance when he ended up in Doubting Castle and Giant Despair and so forth. And despairing of his salvation and so forth. Then remembers that he has this, this key that's promise that can unlock all the doubts that he has. And so he, he trusts in the promise of God and he gets back on the path. That's, that's what that, that whole analogy is meant to teach us. As long as we stay on the path, we're safe. As long as we stay on the path, we'll know we're safe and we're safely on our way to heaven. It's only when we step off the path that we're going to struggle. So stay on the path. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions uh, about that? This is pretty much the end of uh, our material for this morning. Any questions? Okay, well let's close then with a word of prayer.